morning as I was driving the freeway and my iPhone said, I'm not going to tell you where to turn off. <laughs> and I thought, I'm at the mercy <laughs> of this little object whose electromagnetic radiations are slowly destroying either my brain or my crotch, depending on where I'm keeping it. <laughs> so I pulled over <laughs> and we had a talk. <laughs> and I explained that this was really an important group to talk to. And it said, I'll give you an alternate route <laughs> that the other map app won't know. <laughs> so it's nice to be here. <laughs> and just to be clear, um, how many of you have never had any psychedelic experience? Okay. Oh, it's wonder I rarely meet you. <laughs> And of those of you who kept your hands down, how many of you have experienced microdosing? Okay. Now, one of the things that you have noticed is that there's no science yet, just worldwide use. Though there is something I call citizen science, which is the thousands and thousands of people who have talked to each other and helped each other, um, as well as, as the, the mushroom companies who write me uh, thank you notes for all the, the kits they're selling. <laughs> so a microdose of a psychedelic, and I'll just use the term microdose from here on, is a tenth to a twentieth of the amount one would take if one were having a recreational dose. If one's talking about a transformational dose, we're really dealing with much higher numbers. But we're talking approximately 10 micrograms of LSD between a tenth of a gram and a uh, four tenths of a gram of mushrooms, and you can take it from there. The discovery and, and like everything else, when you deal with the natural world and with the plant world, uh, it's always rediscovery uh, by, by ignorant white people. That's our, our system. <laughs> um, but for me, the discovery was Robert Fort told me that Albert Hoffman had told him about a low dose. And I thought that was interesting. My entire career has been with, with relatively high doses. You know, if it isn't transcendence and you don't vanish as a being and you're not one with all things, I'm not that interested. <laughs> so what does the universe do for me? It says, why don't you look at the absolute other end, at the most boring use of psychedelics ever created. No mystical visions, no snakes eating you alive, no angelic being saying, you're really special. <laughs> and I, and, I, and everyone else is too, but you can't hear that. <laughs> so microdosing, it turns out, makes you feel better. And as, um, as Eilat's great book says, it's called A Really Good Day. And those of you who have not microdosed have had really good days, so you know what I'm talking about. Now, the first question was, why, does this little teeny bit have any effect at all? And one of the nice things is, is there's research. And there's a lot of research on, on very low and microdoses. There's a book coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, called The Science of Microdosing. And the research is all very clear, is there are no effects below 25 mics. Now, the problem with all that research 
is that they were looking only for what we would call classic psychedelic effects. So they missed everything else. But being good scientists, they said there are no effects rather than here are the things we looked for and there weren't those. Would have been a little more correct. The other problem, the other question was, given how amazing microdosing is, and I'll go into it in a little bit, why hadn't we been noticing, at least for the past 50 years, because remember, most LSD work in the world comes in two, two phases. One, up till the government stopped it, and it was the most researched psychiatric drug on the planet, several thousand research papers, and there was the period of enormous use, which is, at least in the United States, since it became illegal, 26 million Americans have tried LSD. And that figure goes up four to 600,000 each year, no matter what's going on in the, in the drug world. But nobody was paying attention to microdoses. Well, it, curiously, I was going back to what Sandoz had done, because in the good old days, you wrote Sandoz and they sent you some LSD and said, tell us how you're using it. And the government, if you were doing it that way, gave you a, an exemption to do that and you were on your way. Sandoz only provided LSD in ampules, that's a little bit of glass, a little bit of liquid, 25 mics, or tablets, 25 mics. No one ever considered that there was anything else below that. Well, there is. And in fact, there's a lovely thing which you might just think about with other pharmaceuticals you may have been given. Uh, Albert Hoffman said on the package, when Sando sent it out, it said, before you give this to anyone else, you must use it yourself. Now that's packaging. <laughs> but of course what happened in many cases is you used it yourself and you said, why am I going to give this? <laughs> right? To a bunch of overweight sophomores to see if their blood sugar changes. <laughs> now, the nice thing about microdosing is it's been used for thousands of years by indigenous people. And I was brought, this was brought home to me in a very somewhat embarrassing way. I was feeling Jim the Explorer had discovered this new way and was promulgating it fairly wildly. And an anthropologist said to me, did it ever occur to you that indigenous people might have tried small doses? Given that they've tried every other level of dose. <laughs> and I said, until you mentioned it. <laughs> and then when you begin to look really carefully at some, even of the anthropologists, they have a little throwaway line. There's a 1977 article uh, about the Weecho in National Geographic. And it says they, they, they consider peyote a, you know, a major sacrament, and they use it to... Um, to make it easier to have long, hot walks, to, to, see, to have visions and to see their gods. And I thought, well, those are dosage levels. <laughs> because some of you may know that if you took a fairly large dose of LSD or peyote, you would not take a long, hot walk. <laughs> you might lie in the sun <laughs> and hope that your eyeballs don't get burned out. <laughs> So low doses are out there, and obviously in any hunting and gathering society, South America, um, hunters really do a lot better with something that increases stamina, increases visual acuity, and increases the willingness to focus very, very carefully for long amounts of time. So it's an obvious use. But what happened is I started asking people, would you be interested in trying this very low dose? 
And like some of you, I have a lot of friends who said, oh, sure, man. <laughs> That's cool, yeah. <laughs> I haven't tried that. <laughs> How about next week? I'm kind of stoned this weekend with something higher. <laughs> so I began to get reports. And the first reports were, yes, there were effects. And that was, at that moment, rather exciting. Then I kept asking people, and then people would ask people, and then people who didn't know me would ask people, and I began to get reports from other countries and from people I wouldn't normally meet. And I began to compile the lists of things they said it helped, and it began to get very puzzling. And let me read you a list, and this was, most of this is from 2015. This is things that were improved by the use of 10 micrograms or slightly less every third day. It's the, the, the kind of protocol I suggested for, for exploration, and for exploration only, was one day on and two days off. By the way, that's become, and I read about it, the Fadiman Protocol, in which your entire life is now committed to that schedule. <laughs> I only asked people to do it for a month and said, do what you want after that and let me know. And it turns out after a month, most of the people in our sample, and we're talking thousands, do it less often. So it turns out it's, its major addictive properties are vastly overblown. So what does it help? Anxiety? Not, not general anxiety, not if you're just anxious, but academic anxiety, party anxiety, social anxiety, Asperger's, more ease in social situations. And people who are kind of serious, because most Asperger's people are fairly serious and also like to keep really good records, um, they tend to want to take more than that for the same effect that for the rest of us, 10 is enough. Bipolar, mood elevation during the depression, which is most people, uh, we recommend not doing something during your manic phase, and usually you're perfectly happy not to. <laughs> My favorite in the early ones was no post-Burning Man crash. And as this young woman wrote, a first. <laughs> creativity, this is technical creativity, coding, machine design, a lot of others. Uh, recently, we've been looking at concussions. And maybe we'll have time to get back to that, but if not, we'll, we'll take it in the question time. But concussions turn out to often um, are alleviated in, in many ways with microdosing. And that's something I want to really do a study on. People stopped using or decreased their use of coffee, cigarettes, Adderall, a lot of antidepressants, and what people now write in, they say, oh, I want to, I'm, I'm on this horrible pharmaceutical, I want a microdose, I write back, the word is taper. The word withdrawal, by the way, does not appear in the pharmaceutical literature. But how you get off something is to take less and less and less of it, uh, because most of the antidepressants are incredibly addictive, as some of you unfortunately know. Ice pick headaches. That's a headache where it feels like there's an ice pick going into your eye. They take about one minute, but they can be alleviated in a couple of seconds with a microdose. The long version of that is called a cluster headache. Usually that takes a much higher dose of psychedelics, but a number of people have reported that microdosing solved their clusters as well, and we'd like to look at that. One of the things that's, that you look for when you're getting these reports is changes that nobody asked for, because those are really interesting. In general, when people are microdosing, they improve their health habits. Food choices, exercise, yoga, meditation. Um, early on, a wonderful guy who used to write about 2,500 words a day to me. I know a lot about him. 
and his children and his ex-wife and so forth. <laughs> but he's, he was a junk food kind of guy when he wasn't smoking dope. And he said, I looked at the menu and by God, I wanted the salad. <laughs> so what I want you to get out of that is these changes in habits are not by willpower. They seem to occur as, a, as an effect. There are no, by the way, there are no side effects. There are only effects of things. Um, learning, languages, advanced math. A lot of people said I've, I was much better able to focus in class. Even my lousy teachers got interesting. And a couple of people have said, I was able to look at the PowerPoint once and then just make notes. I didn't have to keep going back and forth. Uh, and people basically talked about better grades and easier exams and so forth. One of the ones that was wonderful, because there's, you just don't think psychedelics, <laughs> menstrual periods. Troubling emotional or physical PMS. A lot of people are reporting improvements to the extent of from horrible to normal. And we have a little sub-study going on that. Physical skills, musical instruments, drumming, composition, flying a plane, driving. Trauma, this is not going to eliminate trauma, but it seems to decrease the triggering. And one of the ones that is peculiar was um, much less procrastination. And when I looked at this, I thought, that's really cool. But then I thought, oh my God, what if the pharmaceutical industry sees this and decides that procrastination is a disease? <laughs> They'll be out there. <laughs> a few people improved in stuttering. Um, writer's block. A lot of journalists who've done articles on microdosing <laughs> indicate that it's great for first drafts. <laughs> and there are two groups of journalists, ones who would write, I am microdosed for a month and then I talked to this guy. The others were, I talked to this guy and then afterwards, I wrote him that I was microdosing. <laughs> and people basically have improved work, amount, discrimination, flow, quality. Uh, they also indicate that they are, are, they are more comfortable with those awful people at work. <laughs> they're also, I have a couple of notes that say, boy, if people knew that it, what it did for your libido, you would have a product. <laughs> um, we haven't seen that as a generalization, but you're welcome to check it out. <laughs> so what happened with this research is we started reporting it. We reported at MAPS, reported in Prague and England. Berlin, and most recently, Go at Horizon. And what happened at the same time was what you might call a media feeding frenzy, which is, there was one article, and then there were eight articles that either quoted it or just stole it. And then there was just an endless round of articles until every magazine had to have had their microdosing article. And each article, of course, led to more people trying it. And more people trying it would write to our site, microdosingpsychedelics.com. That's with a plural, psychedelics. And they would sign in for information and join our study. And the study was, take it for a month, every couple of days. And since we were now doing a more formal study, um, tell us about your emotional states for the prior month. Tell us why you want to microdose and then, of course, we can see from your numbers what happens. And what happens in general is that, and we, we used a very standard uh, instrument called PANAS, it's positive and negative uh, affect states. And we picked a very general, well-known instrument so people wouldn't say, why didn't you use a general, well-known instrument? It's not that great. But what it basically said is, when people are microdosing, their positive emotions go up, and their negative emotions decline. Now, antidepressants, for the few of you they work for, have a partial similar effect. They tend to make negative emotions go down, which is you, can, you, you are much better able to stand being unhappy. Microdoses work 
differently, which is you not only are less unhappy, but you're more happy. And that's remarkable. And as the media frenzy continued, and it continues to this day, uh, right now there's a little sub-unit on Reddit of 20,000 people talking to each other about microdosis. Uh, if you go to the YouTube, the, the highest a single and not, not bad um, how to microdose has 600,000 hits. There's a, there's a group called the Third Wave, that's one word, thirdwave.com, who give classes on how to microdose and are generally setting up kind of friendship units, kind of like psychedelic societies uh, around. Um, there's also a lovely guy in England who sell you a microdose kit. In case you don't know how to measure 10 micrograms. He also includes sterile gloves. <laughs> and I think it's in even a little wooden box. It's really quite lovely. <laughs> well, and because of this huge interest in our, our sample, it's from 59 countries. So when I say it's, it, one of the things I've learned is psychedelics are available worldwide. Um, and what's my time? <laughs> okay. Um, I gotta tell you just one story then. There's, I got a letter from Namibia. Okay, everyone who knows they could immediately go to a map and put their finger on Namibia don't raise your hands, you'll embarrass the people around you. <laughs> he had had, again, those of you who know psychedelics, he had had shingles. Shingles, if you don't take care of them, for some people, it's basically pain. It's pain, pain, pain. This was his third month. He was no longer pretty much sleeping. I mean, it was terrible. He'd done all the things you can do if you start too late. He'd never had any psychedelic experience, and he wrote, he said, but I had a friend in the capital who had some mushrooms, and I just thought it might be a good idea. So this is why I think, you know, divine plays with us. 45 minutes later, he was out of pain. That's what I said, woo. <laughs> and I was so excited, I wrote him back, and other things. I was so excited because I wanted to tell my colleague, Sophia, who was presenting in Prague. And when she got back to the States, I called her and, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you this terrific story. And I said, da, 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 shingles. She said, you know, in Prague, two women came up to me, hugged me and wept. And I said, yeah, she said, shingles. Now, those of you who are into neuroanatomy and brain chemistry and all the things that have not actually proved very useful yet, but you get those great pictures. <laughs> you can figure out why 10 micrograms of LSD can help shingles. And I'll give you one more, even geekier one. This is a negative. This is people who shouldn't microdose. People with red, green color blindness. Some of you may know what a tracer is. Those of you that don't, when you take a regular psychedelic, you see a light source and you move your eye away and, the, and there's a little thin line of light that follows you. It's a tracer. People with red-green blindness, with color blindness, with microdosing, have those tracers for days. Because we, they, we had a few of them in our study and they all dropped out and Sophia wrote them and said, why did you drop out? And they said, tracers. And Sophia, being a real scientist, she said, let me talk to you, Jim, in a couple of days. So in a couple of days, I, she said, I had a friend who has red-green blindness. Yes, it's true. <laughs> she called him, would you please microdose? Yes, there are tracers. What we're doing now, here, so, we're, we, you know, so it's out there. We've explored the island. The, the event space of microdosing has come into being. It's like exploring a tropical island. There's just all kinds of things in it that we don't understand, but they're there. <clears throat> the next thing that happens after, first there's the people who say, I don't believe anything, actually even the sunrise, unless there's a double blind study. <laughs> and they always, at the end of an article, someone says, 
well, there hasn't been a double-blind study. How do we know that all these thousands of people, it isn't just a placebo? One of, one of our many subjects wrote in and said, I don't care if it's a placebo. I haven't felt this good in 20 years. <laughs> and I just loved them to do the one on shingles <laughs> and see if there's a placebo. But anyway, that, what's happening is there are 12 countries in which the usual correct double-blind cross, blah, 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 studies are starting. Canada, New Zealand, um, maybe even the USA. It's a little harder because um, it's, very, it's costly if you have to keep watching people. And in the US, as someone said, it's very hard to talk to our university and say, we'd like to give people a Schedule I drug every couple of days and just let them go home. And the university says, if I say no, what's it going to cost me? If I say yes, what could it cost me? So anyway, 12 other countries are working on it. And we were about to go out of business. And then we thought, what could we do that nobody else can do? Well, we have thousands of people who have microdosed, and we have enough of their information. And they've microdosed up to maybe a year and a half ago. But we only asked them to tell us for a month, and many of them didn't tell us that long. So we are asking approximately 8,000 people to tell us what were the long-term effects for you if you microdosed, if you stopped, how often you do it, what's going on now. Because we're the only group that can really do that because we have this huge base to start from. And that will that will actually be better data than is available for most pharmaceuticals. Uh, little dirty secret. Most pharmaceutical research does not go beyond six months. That which you have been taking for 15 years, no data. So we're trying to move things along um, because it is available, as, as someone pointed out, Mushrooms do not know they're illegal. <laughs> and that's probably what we're going to stop with because um, there's so many people now that want to do the research and they're in positions to do so. And the first group did a beautiful little study in Amsterdam. There was a meeting of a psychedelic society and they the researcher said, would you mind if we made this a research evening? Um, everybody gets a little bit of truffle. Psychedelic truffle is actually, it's a mushroom that just grows underground. Um, and for peculiar reasons, it's legal, more legal than, than the mushroom. So people took some um, intelligence kind of tests, and then they um, truffled. <laughs> Might as well make up a verb when you have a moment. And then later in the evening, they took the tests again. Super clean research called open, you know, open source, so they knew. Um, and it turned out of the three kinds of intellectual uh, activity they were looking at, two improved and one didn't. Um, it's a very beautiful, clean research. And what's wonderful is it took about three hours to get the data. See, my friends in the, in the hard science world um, they do a study, and you've read some of them, you know, 12 subjects. How long did it take you to get the subjects? A year. What it cost? $80,000. And I say, well, I've got five to 10,000 subjects, and it costs awfully little, particularly at my salary. <laughs> and we have a whole different way of doing science, which is called citizen science, which is you find out, you tell us, you help other people. We now have a few things where we say, don't use microdosing, as I say, for anxiety, um, color blindness, very few else. And that's where we're going. So that um, we are returning to the indigenous model, which is you work with people you know, and you work with people in your own life, and you find out how something works. And if it, it's the nice thing about microdosing, if it doesn't work, you stop. 
If it's unpleasant in any way, you stop. And that's the end of it. So I'll see some of you later. And for the rest of you, this is really an amazing event. Just amazing. And I'm so glad to be here. Thank you.